Today, I'm going to be speaking with attorney Peter Mouget, who is a senior partner at Levin Pap Antonio Rafferty and also chair of their securities and business litigation department. We're going to be talking about this uh, proposed twenty six billion dollar settlement against some of the pharmaceutical industry's biggest players. Uh, some of the details w which we talked about earlier this week, Peter, it's great to have you on. First of all, yeah, thanks for having me, David. Appreciate it. So talk to us about first this. This is an opioid related settlement, just to remind our audience, as we talked about earlier this week. Talk talk to us about the genesis of this. How did these four organizations first become the subject of this case? How long has this been going on? I'm going to put those in two different buckets and we'll talk about the manu manufacturers quickly. Yeah. The manufacturer, which is the J&J &J story, J&J &J is both a manufacturer and an importer of raw opium. And they marketed and promoted the uh, opium here in the U.S., similar to a Purdue story. And those cases started earlier. Uh, the, the, the beginning of the, the manufacturer cases was 2014 ish. The distributor cases, which are the big three, and account for 21 billion of the 26 billion really didn't start getting filed by the local governments until late 2016, beginning 2017. And their responsibilities, while overlapping with the manufacturers, are a little different. They have an obligation to review every order, uh, whether it's suspicious because it's a large size, frequency, pattern. And they're supposed to halt shipment and do due diligence. They didn't do it. That's simply their responsibility under the federal regs and why they're on the hook for the 21 billion. So in general, when people talk about opioids, you can look at essentially any part of the chain of how these ultimately get to consumers and find concerning behavior. So you could look at doctors and over prescribing for a period of time, although in some places that has been mitigated, at least to some degree. You can talk about the manufacturers uh, in terms of the clinical trials, uh, sometimes being accused of misrepresenting how long the medications are good for in order to justify FDA approval as being better than what's already out there. You can talk about distributors uh, using sales reps to encourage the purchase and prescription of more like at, at every point, there's there are things that you can find that go wrong. You could even blame the DEA. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, it, there's enough finger pointing to go around. You're absolutely right. So my question, Peter, is in this case, with regard to the four companies in question, what are what is the alleged wrongdoing that you were going after in the case? Well, the distributors and the manufacturers, but primarily the distributors are uh, charged under federal law with designing a system to identify orders of unusual size, frequency, or pattern. We'll call those suspicious orders. And once they flag a suspicious order, they are required to halt the order and perform due diligence before they shipped it. And we have been able to track uh, their system that they were supposed to design going back decades. And suffice it to say, to until 2013, 14, 15, there really was virtually no system in place. So the runaway growth of the opiate epidemic was driven in large part that opiate pills were just flying out the front door with no oversight. And that's what they were supposed to do and the reason why they're on the hook. Now in 14, 15, 16, it got better, but it still really wasn't fixed. And until this injunctive relief in the settlement agreement that requires them to create a clearinghouse spotting red flags run by a third party, I think we'll finally get to some real meaningful uh, red flag test on the, on the distributor side. The manufacturers are a little different in that they have the same responsibilities, but a little further up the food chain and that it's very difficult for a manufacturer to stop a shipment from a distributor. Uh, but they're also supposed to be performing due diligence and reviewing inside of this closed system for suspicious orders. But what we found was is that the manufacturers went out and educated doctors on the lack of addictiveness of the pills and they were safe and the, the, the information coming from the manufacturers was often misleading. So uh, uh, overlapping, but a little bit different uh, on the manufacturer th uh, themes or side of the case. Is it fair to say right now that the uh, nature of the opioid crisis in the United States 
is not quite as severe as it was when some of these cases started? Or is that the wrong perspective? Wrong perspective. It's actually worse. So what's happened now is we have this whole generation of primarily 20 to 40 year olds that uh, are, are addicted to pills. And if we cut the spigot off of pills, the addictive nature of opium, and we've known this for hundreds of years, going back to, we've had multiple, I mean, wars over opium. We've had uh, opium problems here in the United States going back to the 70s with heroin. So what we've seen now is we've started to ratchet down the number of pills is that uh, heroin and fentanyl has just spiked. They're totally inversely correlated. Pills go down, heroin and fentanyl go up, and as a result, last year, deaths were 30 percent higher than they were the year before uh, related to opiate overdoses. So we are not anywhere near out of the uh, out of the problem zone. These cases uh, take years in many cases. They can be very expensive, uh, even from the standpoint of the law firms that that are uh, carrying these cases out. Can you talk a little bit about exactly what your role was within this? Because these are major undertakings with a ton of lawyers doing different things. We had it was I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this this whole operation, but our firm formed a consortium of law firms, meaning a group of law firms, a West Virginia law firm, a Dallas firm. And we were the architects of the distributor case. We were the first ones in the country that filed the distributor cases. Almost 70 percent of the cases in the first year we filed. We were the architects behind the distributor case. And just as importantly, we were the group of firms that uh, recovered the Arcos database and the Arcos database tracks every single pill manufactured in the U.S., shipped to a distributor and then shipped to a pharmacy. We were able to track every one of those pills and then we designed a red flag system that we put on top of every one of those pills in the U.S. So when you saw 100 billion pills distributed in the U.S. from 06 to 14, that was us. So we were able to create a red flag system on top of Arcos and uh, that were that identified the orders that should have been popped along the way with due diligence on them. We were able to implement uh, that or include that into our our litigation, showing what the defendants could have done along the way to prevent this epidemic. So we've been a huge part of that distributor case, our firm and our our group of firms, uh, Paul Farrell out of West Virginia and uh, Baron and Bud, along with our shop, you know, Levin Papatonio Rafferty. In a case like this, what's the general approach of the defense counsel for the corporations? In, and my question is really tailored at this. Is it a defense that is substantive that the average person could understand? Or is it a defense that's basically miring you in technicalities and obscurity? It's both. Hmm. Uh, the technicalities and the obscurities are typically at the and the the motion practice level, and depending on whether the case is tried in front of a jury or a judge, uh, the it's it's primarily finger pointing where you started the show off with uh, pointing at doctors and pointing at patients and blaming everyone besides looking in the mirror, and that's what's really. Uh, a cool about this this settlement agreement that we're taking into our clients. At least the distributors have tried to address the the mess that they participated in creating, and uh, are looking in the mirror saying, "What what can we do? It's a long term problem. We need to have a long term solution." We've got other defendants that are distributors like Walgreens and CVS and Walmart that had even better visibility than the distributors because they were distributors and pharmacies. So if they were getting shipments from three pharmacies. Uh, I'm sorry, three different distributors that Walgreens could see every one of them. And and so they're still finger pointing and not trying to come to the table and see what they can do to be part of the solution. So it's it's a uh, it's going to take everybody looking in the mirror, figuring out what they could have done better and contributing to the solution rather than this continued. The reason why we're here is because of the DEA or is because of the doctors right. or because of the victims. I mean, blaming the DEA is ridiculous. It's like blaming the police officer for getting a speeding ticket. I mean, it. Uh, but th they're throwing everything but the kitchen sink on the defense side. 
when we covered the proposed settlement a few days ago, which is this total of twenty six billion, twenty one plus five for the different parties involved, um, I got a bunch of emails, you know, 10 or 12, uh, 12 emails from viewers saying, hey, you know, to the extent that this is going to compensate some victims, that's great. But in terms of holding these companies accountable in a way where they say, wow, that almost took us down, we can't do that again, that it's not effective, they say, because these com companies price in the fact that at some point this is potentially going to happen. It's just sort of like a probability curve. And they say, you know, over the next 20 years, we should consider that there's going to be some number of billions of dollars that we may have to pay out. We've already got that calculated in and it's not ultimately going to affect us or force us to change our behavior. What do you say to that? that that's a, those are great questions. And, and the, and the your your uh, viewers are, are entirely correct. It, quite frankly, it's the way our whole system works. And there isn't personal accountability at the corporate level that if they get caught, uh, essentially the, the, the stockholders, the shareholders pay these fines. Right. No one pays them. So it is short term. The whole system's designed to drive short term profits up. So senior level management uh, options package and stock patch packages, their compensation levels store soar, and then push the problem and the liability down the further down the timeline for the shareholders to pay. Until we start holding people accountable, so they pay these fines and they're personally accountable. And heaven forbid we actually send somebody to jail, hmm. we won't see conduct changes. Now, this is one of the things that's cool about this settlement is that the settlement includes game changing conduct requirements that are transformative. We will see meaningful change within this supply chain industry, so this won't happen again. It's not gonna be overnight, but we will see fixes. And this money is also not going to coffers to fix potholes or uh, go to fill budget deficits. Uh, almost 90% of these settlement proceeds are being used uh, to treat the opiate epidemic, which is also very, very important. So the money's going to fix the problem. And then there's conduct changes that will prevent this from happening again. Last question. What's the timing of? I mean, it's it's being referred to as a proposed settlement right now. When w might we actually see the money start to change hands? Well, one of the things that we negotiated was an accelerated payment. So the first payments going into escrow uh, this year in August, September uh, of this year, it will stay in escrow until we reach critical mass and critical mass is just sign on from an approval from the cities and counties across the country. Across the country, on the timeline, I see that happening right at the beginning of next year. Mm. So first quarter of next year, the cities and counties will receive two payments, one for 2021 and one for 2022. They'll get the second payment in July. And by July of 2023, they'll have their third payment. So within 18 months from January 2022, to July of 2023, the first three payments will come in the door, which we can really will be a catalyst to really make some meaningful change. Yeah. For, for the speed at which we're used to these things moving, that seems uh, quite, uh, quite, quite reasonable, I guess, is uh, is is what I would say. Uh, we've been speaking with Peter Mouget, an attorney, senior partner at Levin Papantonio Rafferty. Uh, Peter, great to speak, uh, to, uh, speaking with you today and uh, glad to see that this is moving forward. Thanks, David. Appreciate you having me.